Hello and welcome to earlymusicsources.com. My name is Elam Rotem, and today we'll analyze and listen to my absolute favorite variation piece, Svelings Mein Junges Leben hat ein End. In the last 400 years of music history, musical genres and forms have developed and changed over time. The genre of variation pieces, however, was common to all of the different periods. This is probably due to its very simple premise, an instrumental rendition of a certain song or melody that is repeated several times, each time with variations. Because the form is so straightforward, it is easy to see how such pieces work, and thus it is always a treat to observe how great composers went about it. In this episode, we will look at what is probably the most well-known variation piece by Svelink, and if you don't know it yet, you will hopefully see why it is so loved. Let's start. In the instrumental repertoire of around 1600, there are a handful of popular melodies that were turned into variation pieces by many composers. The melody of the German song Mein Junges Leben hat ein End, however, is definitely not one of them. Although there are a few pieces with the same title, they don't have the same melody used by Svelink in his keyboard setting of it. The melody, at least the one that was used by Svelink, may be divided into four parts. An A part that is repeated, and a B part that is repeated. The A part starts with a descending scale and then a cadence. I will play it for you with a generic and simple harmonization. The B part consists of a short repeated melody, which closes with the same cadence of the A part. As you see, the melody includes a lot of repetitions, and many gaps between the phrases, things that would make it rather challenging for the composer to keep the listeners interested, and to maintain a sense of flow. The way Svelink uses this melody in his setting is rather simple. He generally puts it in the top line and fills in the rest, each time differently, of course. Let's examine the different factors Svelink played with in his piece. 1. Counterpoint and harmony. Since only the melody is given, the other voices can vary and create different harmonies at every round. Even the obvious cadential points are treated differently every time, either by means of slightly different cadences or even by avoiding real cadences. Otherwise, Svelink adds little imitations here and there. As opposed to genres where imitations are the main point, such as his fantasias and richer cars, here the imitations are used as a mere spice, as if Svelink simply cannot stop himself from composing elegant counterpoint at every possible opportunity. <music> 2. Diminutions, the most obvious and expected Renaissance way of having variety. It is done by simply breaking the big note values of the melody into quicker ones, be it eighth notes, triplets, sixteenth notes, sextuplets, and more. Here Svelink is truly having fun, sometimes with rather traditional diminutions, like here for example. And sometimes with figurations that are idiomatic specifically to keyboard instruments, like this one for example. or this figure, that was given the catchy name Bombus by some German theorists. Three, octave placement. While the melody is mostly in the top line, in some cases, the repeated elements of the B part are played an octave lower, like here for example.
as we mentioned, one of the obstacles a musician has to deal with when working with such a melody, be it an improviser who plays them on the spot or a composer, is how to bridge the many gaps between the melodic phrases. Looking at what Sveling did in each of these gaps, we find two main techniques. The first is to make some kind of transition that leads to the next phrase, like here for example. The second is to close off the phrase, but in a smooth way. Instead of stopping abruptly at the finish line, adding a bit of a fading tail. This could be done in two ways. The first is a simple one, without changing the harmony of the final note of the melody. Like in this case, for example. And the second way, slightly more advanced, by varying the harmonies below the held final note of the melody. Like in this case, for example. As we showed in another episode, Joachim Burmeister, a contemporary of Svelink, called such a post-cadence tale at the end of a piece a supplementu. We will borrow it and use it also for cadences within the piece. By choosing between a transition or a supplementum for each gap, Svelink determines whether to put a comma or a period in the flow of the music. If we examine his choices in all of the six variations of the piece, we see that at the end of the A parts, as well as the very end, there is always a supplementum, and that between the repeated phrases of the B parts, there is always a transition, in an attempt to blur these gaps. Notice these details when listening to the piece. The ending of the piece is rather odd. The second B of the final variation seems to be missing. Instead, there is a repeat sign, telling us to repeat the first B again. This is atypical for the piece, which is otherwise completely through composed, and also atypical in the context of other keyboard pieces by Sveling. The piece survives in only one manuscript source, and it is believed that it is a faithful copy of a lost autograph. Still, there is a possibility that the copyist, for some reason, did not have the last bars with the second B and in order to keep the structure of the piece logical and consistent, marked a repeat. If you want then, you may treat this last B as a missing segment and try to reconstruct it. For this occasion, however, I will stick with the repetition as indicated in the manuscript. We will now follow the score of the piece with a recording I made here on my Italian model harpsichord. Notice the score, as opposed to the original and most modern editions, was made especially for this occasion, with the aim of differentiating between the different voices. This is relevant mainly for the first, second and less variations, with their refined counterpoint, and less so for the other ones, which focus on fancy figurations. Enjoy!
This beautiful piece has received countless performances on historical keyboard instruments. But not only on them. There are arrangements for piano, two pianos, small ensembles, orchestras, and even newly composed pieces inspired by it. There is something special about this melody, and definitely about Zweling's setting of it. This was our episode about Mein Junges Leben hat ein End. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to check the special page on our website with all the footnotes and other extra information. If you are interested in the original notation of the piece, I also included a video of the piece with it. If you enjoy early music sources, feel free to support us on Patreon. Comment, share and like. See you next time at earlymusicsources.com.